I will be talking about genomics, which is sort of a weird topic to talk in this conference. At least I was told by the reviewers of my application. They said, oh, this is a very interesting topic that I never heard about in the C++ concept, uh, context. Uh, so <laughs> um, that's interesting, and I'm, I'm glad to see people actually here. I was uh, worried that maybe it was too weird for this conference, but <clears throat> I'm glad some of you are still uh, interested in this. Um, so I, I feel like uh, in a conference that there are so many concurrent sessions, I, I feel like I owe to you guys to tell you what I'm going to talk about and give you a chance to run away if you want to, <laughs> uh, if this is not what you're interested in. So definitely, um, I will be talking about these five topics. Because this is a different field, and I, I don't expect you to, to know all about the field that I work on, I will go over an overview of what we do and why we're doing this and how this became a massive computational problem. Um, then I'll tell you about the first example that made us make the shift from Java to C++ and why. And after that is uh, uh, out, I will explain what we are doing, how. There will be plenty of code examples and performance comparisons. Um, uh, so hopefully this will be entertaining to you. <clears throat> so our goal and the reason why we go to work every day is because we want to improve human health. The Institute's uh, 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 mission is to improve human health through systematic data analysis of, gene of DNA and RNA and all gen genetics and genomics uh, data uh, together in a systematic way so you can do large scale analysis and understand not only the simple diseases but also complex diseases like autism, schizophrenia, cancer, diabetes. Um, our institute is uniquely positioned because we are one of the largest sequencing centers in the world and we are involved with all the major uh, complex diseases projects um, being centrally located the, across all the research hospitals in Massachusetts. We do have access to all these samples and, and uh, the top researchers in the world. Um, so. There are really two types of research uh, in, in this, in the, uh, of studies in this, in this realm. One is uh, the rare variant association study, and the other one is the common variant association study. Those are, uh, the goal is the same, is to understand what is causing and what is, the, what is different about the people with that disease compared to people who don't have that disease. The rare one is when you have one disease that is really rare in the population, you have one person or maybe a few people who uh, show that behavior, they come in, we get them sequenced, you compare that to a large set of controls, and you try to understand what is different about that particular group of individuals. That's the, the rare variant association study, or RVAS for simple. Um, the common variant association study is uh, much more difficult to do, is when you have a disease that is pretty much widespread in the population, diabetes is a good example, type two, um, or, or, or cancer, uh, Alzheimer's, and you have a lot of people who have that disease, but you also have a lot of people who don't have that disease. Well, the association here becomes much trickier to do, and you really will need a lot more people from both ends, both controls and cases, to make any significant discovery. So at the Broad, we do tackle both of these. And how we do this? Well, this is my favorite slide because it literally says how to improve human health in five easy steps. Um, the first thing is you choose a disease. You choose the disease that you know from previous data from decades of research that you know there is uh, heritability, that it is a disease that you can trace back to the DNA. Choose that disease. Then you get a lot of samples and even more controls and sequence their DNA. Do large scale sequencing, separate all the, uh, all the data that is similar across everyone. everyone every, every, every DNA base that matches everybody else's DNA base gets excluded. We, we end with what we call the variants, mutations, insertions, deletions, you know, variants uh, for short. And then we take those variants and go to step three. Now we do an association study. Which of these variants are unique or representative or causal of the controls, uh, oh, sorry, of the cases versus the controls? That's what the association study is going to um, try to reveal. Now, after that, you are left with a set of variants uh, or mutations that are proven with a certain uh, likelihood to be associated with that disease. Now it's time to go down to that mutation and understand in the lab on the bench what is the functional modification or what is the function of that mutation? What is it actually doing 
So that if we understand that, and that's what the functional studies uh, will do, we can now think about developing drugs or, therapeutic, or therapeutics in general to try and treat that um, particular mutation. So that's really what we do. Um, our group in particular is focused on large scale sequencing, the large scale sequencing part of it. And uh, we do spread a little bit into the association studies. Um, but the Broad Institute as a whole is focused on this. And I've, I'm talking about scale, and this whole talk's motivation is scale, because otherwise I wouldn't need performance. I wouldn't even be here. We would probably be writing everything in Ruby, like uh, Andre just suggested we all do. Uh, because Without scale, we are not empowered to find the little uh, mutation that, that, that's going to be causal or, or apparent in the population. Reason for that is twofold. First, they are rare, or they are too widespread and it's hard to tease out from regular mutations. Or the second reason is that the data is really, really messy. It's not clean data. When we say sequence a lot of people, uh, usually, in, uh, especially in, in the, the wonderful world of, of computers, uh, we think, well, we get a sequence of DNA, and now I just have to look for the differences. Well, it's not quite like that. The, the, difference, the, the machine makes tons of errors. The whole lab process up to the sequencer makes even more errors, and understanding what is true variation from error is very difficult. Nevertheless, we have been taking this systematic approach. We have built computational tools for that, and the results have been very uh, uh, successful in the last 10 years. Uh, I show here some uh, uh, results that we've had, recent results and papers on, the, on four uh, major diseases that we study, type 2 diabetes, schizophrenia, early heart attack, which is uh, early onset myocardial uh, infarction, and coronary heart disease. So this is paying off. We are definitely moving in the right direction. However, uh, the scale that we are at today is not even near what we need to, where we need to be to make the big discoveries of the major diseases. Um, so just very briefly, I will just give you a, an overview of what the Broad looks like. Uh, this is our arsenal of sequencing. <coughs> For those of you who understand uh, and know, know what the, 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 the materials or the, the equipment are, these are the numbers that you can go by. Um, what I want to highlight here is that we do in 2013, this is when these numbers were from. Uh, I don't have the 2014 numbers yet, but they are way bigger than this, uh, especially because of the, 10 high, uh, the 14 high CCACs that we acquired. Um, we were producing uh, 2.1 2 .2, terabytes of data a day. And by the end of 2013, we produced 6.5 petabit, petabytes of data just that year. Uh, the Broad has been in operational uh, since 2003. <laughs> um, and just the number of projects we've been doing, this is usually, I usually point out this slide to say that, yes, our major product is exomes, but that's changing now with the HiSeq X. We are doing more genomes in exomes, uh, or we will eventually. Uh, but until 2013, exomes were the, the biggest products that we were generating, and these numbers are just for the year of 2013. Now, uh, this really shows you how the data production, and by data I mean DNA sequencing, is scaling astronomically every year. So this is the amount of bases produced, not bytes, bases, DNA bases produced at the Broad Institute since 2009. And you can see this is not linear growth. Um, and the bar for 2014 is the expected. Uh, I can tell you that we are above the half line there right now. So we may or may not meet the expectation, but whatever we do, we will be way above uh, the, the, the 1,500 uh, tera bases produced. So that's 1,500, that's, uh, 1. Uh, 1,500 trillion bases of DNA. Now, that amounts to about, if we do reach the 2,000 uh, tera bases, it, it'll amount to an expected 300 petabytes of data total uh, uh, put together with the previous years of data that we are plowing through at the Broad Institute. That is a lot of data. <coughs> and it's not going to stop. If you haven't seen this plot before, this is the cost of sequence plotted against the Moore's Law. Cost of sequencing is dropping and going faster than Moore's Law. Um, so no wonder computers couldn't keep up with the amount of data we're, do we're dealing with. Um, the main product of our group is the GATK, or the Genome Analysis Toolkit. 
Uh, we developed this in 2000, it started in 2007, we released the first few versions in 2009. It is both a toolkit for people to run their analysis on, but also a developer framework. It was entirely done in Java. Um, and the reason for that, before you curse me, is that be, back then in 2007, the amount of data we were dealing with was very, very small. The challenges were to handle 50 exomes. That was nothing. That was really, really simple. Today we talk about projects of 30,000 exomes, 100,000 exomes, 130,000 exomes. Those are uh, many orders of magnitude more data and, and, and uh, computational power than we were dealing with back in 2007. Doesn't seem that long ago. But back then, performance was not the issue in any way. And neither was any attempt to make a highly uh, sophisticated system. We were trying to figure out what to do. We didn't know what was needed to do. We knew, we knew that the DNA would come in from the, the blood or, or the cells that you would take. It would go through the sequencer, come out. And since 2003, the analysts were jumping into the data right there and trying to do their analysis. Well, no wonder not much was done back then because the data is very errorful. So in 2000, since 2007, we were really figuring out what kind of statistical methods we needed to apply to really understand and clean up and process that data before we could even do the analysis. So turns out that the Broad had a base of uh, Java software engineering that was well established. We had some tools, so Java made sense to start at the time. That's what we used. Uh, the GHK was very, very well uh, adopted in the, in, in the world. You can see those, uh, that world map is really the number of usages in the GATK at a, at a given time. We have users all over the world. Uh, we are by far the most used tools in, in, in uh, DNA data analysis, and as well as a framework. So there's a lot of people, uh, including this room, who have used the GATK, gone to the source code, and wrote, written their own tools. So this should serve as a motivation to say that, yes, there are a lot of people out there who want to write code and would really enjoy to have a framework that would enable them to do this uh, efficiently and more easily. And just so you know, we do give training on the GATK and everything. There's, there are many workshops, uh, upcoming workshops and past workshops. Um, there are video tutorials online if you want to learn more about the GATK and all of the tools. That being said, I always say that our biggest contribution to the community was not the tools, it's not the code that we produce. Rather, it is this table. It is the best practices on what to do with DNA data, right? So I don't think that how to do it or, or, or the code to do it is the most important thing. Rather, was figuring this out is really the best uh, thing we could have done to the community because we enabled other people to go out there and write you know, competing uh, implementations to discuss with us and, and improve. And we are very welcoming of that. Uh, so this is the standard best practices for DNA data analysis. There is a similar one for RNA data analysis in our website um, and was uh, put together and continuously updated uh, by our group. You will notice that, sorry, you will notice that there are three panes to this best practices. The first one is data processing. This is basically data cleanup coming out of the sequencer. The middle one is variant discoveries. Now assuming that you have clean data, we can actually run a statistical Bayesian statistical method to try and determine what's variant from what's not variant. And then the third part is where the analyst is going to come in and do quality control on the data and start doing their association studies. So those are the three pains there. So let's talk about the motivating example that really shifted us from Java and into starting into trying out C++. It all happens in this particular point in the uh, best practices pipeline, which is a joint genotyping. That's where you take all of the calls and you want all, all of the data and try to put it all together. If you're doing a project with 30,000 exomes, this is the point where you're going to take the 30,000 all together and try to determine the genotypes, meaning what is the actual call at that position in the genome of each one of that patient. By call, I mean is the individual AC or AT, assuming we're all diploids. <clears throat> so that's the step where it all happens because obviously it's a very, very uh, compute intense project, uh, process, uh, part of the process. The ideal deliverable of this process would be a matrix, a full matrix with the samples on the x-axis and all the genomic positions on the y-axis of all the mutations that you can see in all, any of these samples and all of these samples. This would be the ideal uh, format that we could give to the analysts so that they can start their, their association study. Uh, notice that mutations are not, these are not 
this is not a Boolean matrix. This is not true or false. I have a mutation here. I don't have a mutation here. Rather, this is, I may have one of many types of mutations here. This could be SNPs or indels. Uh, it could be an A to C mutation or an A to T mutation. Those are different. As well as the probability of observing that mutation. Like I said, the data is very messy. It's very difficult to observe these things. So it's worthless to say there is a mutation here with 100% certainty because that's not true. Rather, we have to do our best effort to communicate to the analyst what is our certainty that we observe whatever event we're observing there. So we spend a lot of time making these methods output uh, confident uh, likelihoods. And that's what the numbers, that's what the numbers you're seeing there uh, mean. These are just rounded up into the log version so we don't have to deal with doubles, but they are likelihoods. Now, it would be, identifying mutation would be a very simple case if this is what the genome looked like. This is a picture of IGV, which is a typical uh, genome, genomic viewer uh, that you would do if you'd sequence your genome. It would load your file here, and you, that's how you would see your genome. Each one of these gray bars are reads or sequences of genome that were read by the machine. And when they're all gray, that means that your sequence matches that of the reference sequence. The reference sequence is listed down here. And if you're gray, it just means you match, you have the same nucleotide as the reference sequence for the reference human genome. And whenever they show up, they, uh, some letter shows up, that means that letter is different from the, from the reference genome. You can see that the reference on that position is C, and this genome has a T. It has a T in half of the reads. Well, we are diploids, we have two copies of every chromosome, so one of them was mutated from a C to a T. That is a very clean, very easy to see mutation. We could spot that by eye. That was the expectation of all the scientists back in 2003, but that doesn't turn out to be so true. You can notice that the other Cs you see in the slide are shaded out, are faded out, which means they have very, very poor quality. Yes, the machine thinks it read a C there, but the confidence of the instrument was so low that the probability of that observation is low, and the viewer just shades, shades it out so it doesn't uh, bring noise to your view. But even here, on a really good shot, you can see that there's already noise. Yes? Uh, why are these bars different lengths? Is it just each bar a sample? Um, no, so uh, it is a sample of the sequencer. So you, you put your DNA in the sequencer, and the sequencer will read many, many times whatever you put in there, right? So each line here, each bar, is one, we call it a read, is a segment, a continuous segment that the, the, the instrument read. Uh, they are, they can be different lengths. In this case, they aren't because they're from Illumina and Illumina, they're all the same length. It's just that I wrapped, I, I, this is just a snapshot. So these lines continue over here. So they're all about, uh, they're all 72 by 76. So they're all 76 base pair long. Uh, but they could be, in other, in other instruments, they can be different lengths. So, so just to see if I understand it. Yes. So Absolutely. Imagine a book. You take a book and, and you chop it all up into little tiny sentences, right? And, and then you put it in a pile. And that's what the instrument gives you, just that pile. Now, the aligner, which is the first step in the best practices pipeline, and you'll see there map to reference. This is what is called shotgun analysis, yes. So, so the aligner will try to rebuild that book. That's, that's what it is. And this is the view of the rebuilt book as best as the aligner can do. <clears throat> so um, hopefully that's clear. Um, the real data actually looks more like this. This is what real data looks like. It's really messy. Uh, you, you're seeing tons of A's and G's and uh, difficult uh, mutations to call. You also see some deletions. It's what those bars mean. That means that probably there was a deletion there. But the confidence of each one of these calls is what a variant caller will try to estimate. So there's no hard truth. You can't say it is variant, it is not variant. You really have to associate any, uh, any uh, assumption or any uh, mutations that you report with the probability. And that's really what we do. Yes? Where did the reference come from? The reference comes from a number of individuals uh, put together, and you just average the observations. Those are done over and over and over to very high depth. So you can really have a high confidence that what you're observing is the truth. And the reference genome is compiled and updated every so many years by the Reference Genome Consortium 
and you know they try to do the best possible job. So a mutation well, like this is not necessarily a bad mutation. Most mutations are not bad at all. Some of them may just mean that, well, I am not what the reference is, but you know, I just have this T here. Yes. Yes. Which are not, you know, which are what makes this individual human being. Right. So then I don't really see the difference in the difference in things. Right. If you get differences, then how do we ascribe meaning to them? Absolutely. Um, great question. Uh, the, everyone is different. The, different. the reference is not going to represent everyone. And uh, in fact, you are expected to have at least one in every thousand bases be different from the reference. That's just the expectation based on you know, heterozygosity in the population. Uh, but the reference allows us to do this fast. Uh, the, the, the best approach, let's talk about a, a streaming, a screening device. Um, the reference is, is, this, is this tool that we have that brings everyone into the same system of coordinates. That's really what it is. It puts everyone into the same system of coordinates so I can compare individual A with individual B. Uh, it's really all it is. But you're right that because it is not the same as the other individuals, when I'm trying to re-put together that book, I'm going to make a lot of mistakes, some critical. Um, but you know, aligners get better and better. Um, they, they, they've, uh, we, there's paper after paper showing that, although this is what I'm showing you, about 97% of the genome will be pretty good and very well aligned. But there's you know, the diseases are in that 0.1%. And, and it, those are really hard to get. And, and you know, that's, that's why we're here. I mean, this is def far from being a solved problem. You're, you're right to, to fear. There, there are many problems that come because of that. Right. And so the thing is that we, it, it can never get to work. It would only be perfect if we were all the same. Yes. Uh, so it, there's, it's not a question of our sequencer is not sufficient clean up, our aligner is not sufficient clean up. The nature of our mechanism, the nature of our method is to try and separate out the special cases. Yep. But that kind of depends on our reference. So there's a little bit of, uh, you know, what was the other looking for there? <laughs> uh, we're kind of looking for the differences, and on the other hand, the reference would be eliminating the differences, right. but we might have, it's even possible, we might have, in our reference, eliminated something that's important. Mm -hmm. It does. Uh, the likelihood of there being a gene that 50% of the population doesn't have, but it, 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 it never showed up in the reference, gets lower and lower, the better the reference gets. Uh, and the expectation here is that we're going to find the small mutations that are actually causing something. The very, very large mutation or structural variants are much more rare. Uh, and, and they are harder to do, harder to find, much because, and, 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 and a, lot, a lot of it because of the reference system that we have. But the reference. Um, based alignment does allow us to go to the large scale. If we were to try and produce the assembled genome of every person, we would be talking about maybe 50, 100 patients here, not hundreds of thousands or millions. Um, that's, that's really, there, there, there are you know, pros and cons. And if you assemble every genome individually, then the job of comparing the two becomes a very difficult task, because now you're comparing graphs, basically. Um, but I would love to talk about that. <laughs> uh, so. I was just going to skim through this, just saying that this is the, uh, the Bayesian uh, problem model that we apply to every one of those locations where you see variants. You take those variances and you uh, build, uh, build a, a, a graph, and I'm going to explain it in detail. So uh, we, the way we do variant calling is we go through the genome, we look for active regions. Active regions are basically regions where you see that mess going on. So we skip everything that looks perfect. That is an interesting. 
as soon as we see something that looks weird, we go and build a de novo assembly graph, which is basically a, a, a graph of all the possible paths that you could that you could thread through that region of the genome, including the reference. And out of those paths, we take each one of those paths, and we will call that a haplotype. Basically, it's a sequence. We take each one of the paths, and we evaluate them against the observed data, the reads. So we'll take all those haplotypes and evaluate them against all the reads, and we will take the most likely haplotypes and say, well, this is the most likely variant or non-variant compared to the reference that I can observe in this region. That's what we do in the pair HMM evaluation. The pair HMM is a hidden Markov model that compares the pair of read and haplotype. We do all of them, and then we uh, sum the, the, the sum of the probabilities of each haplotype against every read is its own probability. And in the end, we then put it into the genotyping exact model, which is the model that I just showed here, to calculate the probability of that genotype. This is our variant calling. It's called a haplotype caller. In four steps, this is exactly what it does. It takes 7.6 days for each genome in a CPU. It's really slow. That's fine if we're doing 50. You have 50 computers. You can, you know, you can split the computation and do this in a few hours if you want to. Just add more computers. But it's, uh, it's very, very expensive. And now we're talking about doing hundreds of thousands or even millions. We're talking about 2 million genomes by the end of next year. Uh, many countries are doing genome projects of 300,000 genomes and 100,000 genomes in Qatar and in uh, England. So numbers are not scaling to that. So <clears throat> a year and a half ago, we were given the task of understanding why was this slow. And remember, we never thought about performance when we implemented this. So it's not a surprise, per se, that this is slow. We knew it was slow. So I looked at all those four components. And actually, the pair HMM is responsible for 70% of the runtime. What do you do? Well, let's optimize the pair HMM. Great. So the pair HMM is very simple. It looks a lot like an edit distance algorithm, except that you have probabilities and it, it, they have to sum up to one. And the, 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 the steps from one uh, cell to the, to the next is not just taking the max. It's actually summing the probabilities of those paths multiplied by the probability of taking that step. So if you're coming from a deletion, you go to an insertion, there is a probability of that. If you're coming from a match to an insertion, there's another probability. You multiply that. And in the end, you have the result, pro resulting probability of your read versus haplotype in the top right um, cell of your matrix. So that's basically what the, the, what the pair HMM is. It's really not a complicated algorithm. If you want to look it up, it's in uh, Richard Durbin's book, chapter four. Um, it's, a, it's a full description. We have a slightly modified version of it. Our paper is coming out soon. So we took that code in Java. I personally took that code in Java. I rewrote it as much as I could to make it as efficient as I could in Java without major JVM uh, tweaking. And I ran that, and I convinced myself that there was nothing else I could do, um, and my friends who looked at the code as well. And I talked to a few of my friends who were doing GPU programming. That was still very slow. So I took to a few of my friends, and actually, I should say, the 7.6 uh, CPU days is after all of that. So that's the as optimized as I could get in Java for the very HMM. <coughs> um, so I talked to a few of my friends, and I said, oh, let's try to put this in the GPU. Let's try to do FPGA acceleration. Let's do all that. What is the first step to do that? Well, you have to write that in C++ or C, because you can't do FPGA. You can't call into the hardware from Java. There's just no way. You can't do it. So well, I took the code. I wrote the exact same algorithm in C++, exact same algorithm. And just that was enough to give me a nine-fold performance. Now, nine-fold is not what you usually see from a C++ versus a Java comparison. But here, there were two specific reasons why this was the case. First, the matrix of objects in Java uh, was always dereferencing to memory. So every time you had to make an access in every single cell, you had a cache miss. Just cache misses at every computation. And there was no way for me, except from uh, coding everything into a static array, which is hideous, and I would have to go around everything Java does for you to do, make that happen, to have Java put the objects, the entire, class, the, the entire object inside memory contiguously. There was no way to do that. So the cache misses were a big, big culprit, culprit for this uh, performance difference, uh, which is, I have to say, not usual. Usually you're, you see you know, two-fold, maybe, uh, not nine-fold. The other reason is Java's floating point uh, model 
is that uh, is, is, a, is a model that is very amenable and very good for Sun uh, system risk uh, uh, platforms, Spark risk platforms, but it's not very good for uh, Intel x86 systems. Turns out uh, that the floating points in the risk platform, which I am not an expert on, if there's an expert here, I would be glad to hear from you. When they get too small, they do get denormalized because there is a harder instruction in those platforms that actually continue to operate on a denormalized float. Whereas on the Intel platform or x86 platform, those become software instructions. So those additions and subtractions and, and, and divisions that you're making at every cell in this matrix become software instructions. And now you're paying maybe 1,000 cycles instead of two or four cycles in each one of those floating point operations, which we do a lot in the parity map. So this is really a specific situation. And I have tried in every way I could to simply turn off the denormalized uh, floating point numbers in Java. I couldn't do it. But I'm sure there is a way to do it. It's not trivial. I couldn't do it. Um, given those two reasons, the same exact algorithm in C++ was nine times faster already. Not to mention that it allows us to play around. So we wrote this in CUDA. We tried several different implementations. It was really cool. We had different uh, boards. And look, we got up to 154 times faster when we ran this on a Tesla K40. That's really cool. So this code uh, for, for AVX and FPGA are today the standard in the GHK. Even the Java, we just wrote a JNI that calls into it. And it's what people get. The GPU code uh, would be too hard to adapt to the Java framework. So we decided to not do that. Instead, hold on because, well, we're moving to C++. So once we do, that code will come in too. <coughs> so the joint genotyping, although a very big problem, is not the full story. The data processing pipeline is also not scaling very well. The, 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 the left pane there takes about 44 hours to complete per genome. That's a lot of time. And if you look at this, you will see that not all the programs are using all the threads available, all the cores available in the computer because of the way they were implemented. It's just not amenable to that. Even worse, if you look at the CPU utilization of all of these uh, tools over time, you can see the x-axis is time and it goes up to 44 hours. Uh, it's barely using the CPU, barely using the CPU. And I'll tell you, the, these tools are all single threaded, but we were running them in, in uh, in a MapReduce fashion parallel. So we just spawn 24 um, uh, processes with different sections of the data, and then we just aggregate the data in the end just by doing a reduction on the result. This is how we run everything, because otherwise it would have taken, I don't know, 100 days. Uh, so we're even with the forceful use of the cores of the CPU, this is the profile of CPU usage. It's very low. The first time I showed this plot at the Broad, uh, all of the developers, including all the Java engineers and everything, said, oh, obviously, you are waiting for I.O. You are I.O. bound. Our files are huge. They're pretty big. Each genome is about 300 gigs. Uh, so the files are pretty big. Loading them from disk and from network and everything, that's what's going on. You're waiting for, for I.O. That's not even close to being true. The I.O. is barely, barely being used. It's, it's mostly idle. So what is it then? Well. We took down the assembly code, and we, we checked the, the instructions. And just over 70%, I don't remember exactly, 73% of the, all of the instructions are memory fetches. Everything we are doing in the code is waiting for memory to get back to us so we can do a very tiny computation. Every, every other instruction, or, or even more than it's like 70% of the instructions are instructions that go into memory and wait for the memory to come back. That's what's slowing most of our code base. And this is a profile of the entire uh, pre-processing pipeline, from alignment all the way down to, um, to base recalibration. <coughs> so that is the result of excessive use of some of the objects and, and, and collections in Java that are not amenable to data contiguity and cache coherence. Uh, we do have a lot of strings, maps, sets to handle basic structures. And if we wanted to optimize those things, it's really hard to do in Java. It's not, some of it could be optimized, bring it all to static arrays and do it all there, but then you lose everything the language gives to you. And other things we just can't do anything, like the floating point model is just incompatible. There's a lot of numeric computation here. It all, uh, there's a lot of very small floating point in most of the statistics that we do, and they're just falling down. Um, and in the end, even if we want to, we can't do hardware optimizations in Java unless we delegate to the JNI, and oh my god, it was hard to deal that. 
It was so difficult to get the program to talk to Java, to transform all the data structures, send to the C module, compute in the C module, pack the results, send it back to Java. The overhead was about 10%, so the overhead itself was not big. But tying the things together was a lot of work, and we quickly deemed it not viable, and we're not doing it again. We did it once for the parachute, man, we're not doing it again. So just to show you a teaser, this is a uh, piece of code from the haplotype caller where you can see a map of a map of a map, which is instantiated into a linked hash map. This is very typical. If you look everywhere in the code base, this is how you know, we, we handle all the associ associative containers that we need to do. And that just, you know, that's where all your memory instructions are going to be looking like. Remember, we were not trying to do performance. And not, I am guilty of a lot of this, too. We were just writing code to try to figure out what to do. Focus was never performance. So there's no data locality. Most lookups will be a lot of cache misses, and that's why it's slow. That is why it's slow. <coughs> so now let me try to show you how we shifted entirely and started thinking about performance as a first class citizen and redesigned the engine from the, from the bottom. So we started um, by revisiting the, the, the file formats and, and, the, and, and the, 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 all the input and output, all the data that gets loaded in and, sh and, and printed out, because this is most of the heavy lifting that we have to do before we go into the computation. Um, we just assume that once we are in C++ and we have access to hardware and everything, optimizing the computation will not be the hardest thing to do if we do the data processing correctly. So for example, the alignment data, which is the read data that I showed on the, on the picture there, on IGV picture, um, is really centered around this raw shared data. It turns out that the binary version of those files, those files are all text files, SAM files are text files, VCF files for variants are also text files, but they all have a binary version of it. And the binary version was the, decided on a committee, international committee and everything, to be this contiguous byte array with all the information contiguous on disk so that it, is, it should be easy for you to load it from, from disk to memory and then operate in memory. In the Java uh, framework, what we do is we load this byte array, which I represented here. This is the, the representation for one read, for example, and you just have sequ sequential byte arrays like that. We load the byte array, and then we parse each one of those uh, fields there into many objects so that we can make the axis, air quotes, easy uh, uh, into the Java framework. Now, what we're doing is we are butchering all the possibility that we had for data, uh, for data contiguity and, and you know, uh, cache, fast cache access. So we started from scratch and we said, well, this is beautifully laid out data. We should, shall not touch it. So when we load this now in the C++ framework in GameG, we load the byte array. That byte array is this shared raw data, the shared block of data that we don't touch. And all of the objects around the alignment, and if, you, if you've ever done any coding there, you understand that same as the alignment, bases are the actual read bases, the qualities are the probabilities of observing each one of the qualities, and, and so on and so forth. We'll just hold shared pointers to that raw data and indexes. So if you want to add, if you want to check base 24, we just go index directly into that byte array and give you access to that byte or int or whatever it, it is that you were trying to access. Uh, so the in-memory representation turns out to be now the same as the disk representation. So loading files is as fast as it can be. It's disk, it's still slow, but it's not as fast as it can be. It's literally a mem copy. Uh, and once you load that memory and start accessing anything inside that read, that is going to be as close to the processor as it can be because it's all contiguous. And these arrays are not long. So <clears throat> what you can also do, and we do it a lot, is just batch hundreds or, or thousands of those reads and do operations all, in all of them in a contiguous fashion. The same thing is valid for the variant. It's a very similar model. Variants have two types of data. There's the data that is common to all of the samples. So that, that's what we call the site data. And there's data that is individual to each sample. That's the individual data, uh, the sample data. So there are two byte arrays, and that's how it's, they're laid out in memory, one next to the other. And we replicate that. So reading is just a mem copy of those two byte arrays. And then we unpack this collection of pointers that allow you to index into those two byte arrays without ever making any copies. And now all the accesses to the variants are done directly into this contiguous block of memory. All the same rules apply. The sites are simpler. It's just an array, very much like the, the, the alignment data. The per sample data is organized in a very intelligent fashion. It is organized in a way that each field, and here I have genotypes in the first, and then field one, field two, field three, whatever they are, genotype qualities, probabilities, likelihoods, anything, allelic depth, 
they are all organized one next to the other, and each one of them will contain the values for all the samples. What is the most typical access pattern of all tools out there, or of all genomic analysis? Is to take, for example, all of the genotypes of every sample and do some operation with it, or take the genotypes and the probabilities of observing that genotype and do some computation with it. So when you do this now, you're literally taking a contiguous array of memory of all the genotypes and another contiguous one, which is very close to the other one, of whatever field you're trying to analyze, and then you do an operation with both of them. So now everything is close to memory. There's no copies being made anywhere. You access everything directly into those byte arrays, and the, and the shared pointers will do the magic if you, if you try to create several objects, some to see the genotypes, others to see the fields, others to see the alleles. That's fine. The raw data is never copied. <coughs> Neither do you have to worry about freeing that memory. Now, it's all beautiful when you're reading uh, and you get the, 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 the byte array in place and you access it with indices, but if you want to change it, modify it, add the new field, or modify the fields in there, um, that will be a little bit complicated if every time you change, let's say, one of the fields, you rewrite that entire byte, byte array. So both the alignment and the variant have uh, a builder-like style of modifying the objects that we built. And the builder will basically cache all of the modifications you, you have queued in to do until you hit build. When you say build, then all of those modifications are slated to happen. And then you build that byte array only once and set that as the new, as the new byte array pointing that your variant points to. Same thing for the, the SAM alignment. Now, there were a few uh, implementation options that we uh, contemplated while doing the builder. Uh, and actually, David, who's the, the author of the builder, is uh, here, so it's good if we have any questions about that. Uh, <coughs> uh, we could, uh, every new object that, was that, that would be modified could be allocated and, you know, have a little block of memory allocated and sitting there waiting, queued, to be added into the byte array. You could then pile up all these objects, and then finally when you create the byte array, you traverse the memory, find all those objects, and transform that into the final byte array. That was option number one. The other option is to use the same idea as the short string optimization, where we have a static, statically allocated uh, uh, array inside of each one of those objects, which will hold enough memory for a short modification, short object modification, which is 99.999% of the time. So every time you're doing a short, small modification, as long as you're not creating a giant array inside of it, we will prefer to write that memory inside that object in the statically allocated array. So we're not allocating new memory in the heap. We're just doing everything local. And in the end, when you make all your modifications, you can just contiguously traverse that memory, creating the byte array as you go. Now, this was very interesting. We, we, we were inspired by the STL. And the performance improvement was significant. And you can see we didn't really run this. Uh, I mean, we didn't have time to run this on a very large database. We ran on a very small database. You can see 3,000 records. That's nothing. That's not, maybe a thousand samples would be uh, would have more than a, than three thousand fields uh, set by the builder. So in a very even in a very small data set, you can already see that the two lines are diverging linearly, but you can already get a two-fold improvement just from having the short string optimization into the builder. Uh, <clears throat> so that is very nice, um, and th th this is done on three million variant records. Um, now. After we've built this library, we started writing some test code and some test programs to try and compare it to the old performance with the Java. And reading, for example, alignments, SAM alignments, just reading a BAM file and printing it out, not doing anything to it, just reading and writing that file with the new framework compared to the old Java framework is 17 times faster. Just 17 times faster. That's what you get from, from the memory contiguity, no copies, no arbitrary objects, and no memory, uh, random memory access. Uh, the same thing is true for variants. Uh, variants, we made the option of being extra fast with the binary format. Same thing for the, 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 for the alignment format. So when you put a binary variant file, we are an order, or maybe almost two, uh, an order of magnitude faster, uh, two orders, almost two orders of magnitude faster than the binary file uh, reading and writing of the Java framework. For the regular file, yes, we're also still almost uh, 50 times faster uh, than, than the Java version. And 
even though we are paying the cost of reading the text file and parsing it into the byte array. So reading a text file that's not binary formatted for us is the worst case scenario, because we have to read each element, parse it, and put it into the byte array format. And still, we beat by a lot, because all the accesses that would, it, even though in this test case there's no access being done afterwards, which you would benefit highly, you're still faster than the original Java framework to do that. Now, what about a real tool? So if you remember the panel on the left side, one of the tools is duplication marking. That's a simple tool. Uh, and at this stage, because we're focused on the library, the tools we're writing are very simple. And we chose mark duplicates because it is a simple tool. So that's very interesting, actually. We wrote a new algorithm. We looked at the tool. We rethought the algorithm. Mark duplicates, the original, uh, was written by Picard. The Picard team is the team at the Broad. It uh, was written a long time ago. Uh, we just rethought the algorithm. We wrote a different algorithm, a different approach that gives the same result, but it's obviously more efficient. And uh, I wrote it, and, and, and we, we, we compared the results. And an exome was done in four minutes, and a genome was done in one hour. If you remember the first table, mock duplicates takes 11 hours on a whole genome and about two hours on a whole exome. So that's huge performance difference on an actual tool that we have to run for every genome that we sequence. This is huge. Well, but it's also unfair, because we're, we're comparing a different algorithm. So obviously, we were very close to their team, and we talked to them. And immediately, they thought, well, that's a great idea. I'll implement the same algorithm. And they implemented the same thing with small differences. I have to say there's small differences there, but the output is the same. And their version now is way faster, too. It went down to 20 minutes per exome and about four, four, four hours and 45 minutes for a genome. Much faster, but it's still four times slower than the new tools that we were able to write in the new C++ framework. <coughs> so I uh, would like to just show you, this is a C++ conference anyway. So what about the C++ features that we're using? And how is this library available? What are, what are we actually doing? Well, there were a few things that we've done with C++ 11 and 14 that made our lives a lot easier than they would have done, that would have been before. One of the things is we took Herb Sutter's advice of almost always auto, almost literally, there were a little bit of a fight, and there was a little bit of a fight in the beginning. People, some agreed, some disagreed, but we decided, no, let's try this out. Seems like a good idea. Well, if you look at our code, the look, everything looks like the bottom there. Const auto, const auto, every, everywhere. It's a little bit strange. It's a little bit of a shift. But as the library gets uh, evolved, as the library is being developed, uh, we had to change the interface many, many times. We're learning. We're trying, trying different things. But the client code never had to change. That was really good. You know, I, I know a lot of people here don't, don't like auto. I don't know if in this room, but in the conference, I heard a lot of bad things about auto. But it saved our very many times. <laughs> and, and it was really good. So we were able to do, make changes, like in the top there. The initial implementation of the fields of a variant were the simplest thing we could think about. That thing looks like a vector of vectors. We will implement it like so. Just mem copy the whole thing, make it a vector of vectors, and give it back to the caller. People started writing tools. They started using it. Performance was OK. Many times better than Java, but we knew we could do better. So later on, we revisited the problem and said, well, we don't really need to make copies here. Let's just rewrite these with objects that are just pointers to the byte array and just navigating the byte array and giving it back to you. Well, OK, we overload the bracket operators. And there you go. The client code does not need to change, because they never wrote vector of vector of you went anywhere. They just wrote out. So thanks, Herb, for that. Hope he sees me in the video sometime. <laughs> um, another thing that we've been using everywhere is shared pointers and unique pointers. Shared pointers in particular because of the nature of these data structures. Because we have one little piece of shared raw data, it makes sense for them to be shared pointers so that we can spawn objects everywhere uh, from that original data. So you have an original vi variant and you want to look at their info fields, that's fine. Pull the, 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 pull the info field. That becomes a shared object. No copies are made. We just navigate through the shared data. Even if the variant goes out of scope, well, you're safe because your object has a shared pointer to that original raw data. Uh, it makes a lot of sense for us to use that. Same thing goes for the alignment. This is an example of what we're doing here. So the, the entire raw data is uh, contained inside M body, and it's a shared pointer. And that's passed on to the constructor of all the objects that are spawned from the getters of the SAM. Uh, so that has also simplified our lives a lot. <clears throat> so writing tools to perform operations on variants is very, very simple. So here's an example of a very simple tool that calculates the percent of missing 
uh, genotypes in a file. So you can load a VCF as simple as saying uh, in a for each loop where each record comes from a single variant reader. Single just means one at a time. You can do batched if you want to, but this one, this reader in particular <coughs> gives you one at a time. <coughs> you take a record at a time and do whatever you want with it. In this case, we are going to take the GQ, which is the genotype qualities. That's the probability of observing the genotypes, which is the output of the PerHMM. Uh, <coughs> and we're going to use count if with the lambda uh, to see whether the variant is missing or not. If it is missing, we count. If it's not missing, we don't count. If not, this is percent missing. It's as simple as it gets. Again, these are QC tools that we use all the time, and we were just evaluating them. And you calculate the percent missing. So <clears throat> that is literally all you need to do to navigate the files uh, with this framework. Uh, you can do similar things with the alignment files or the read files. You just go for each record on a single SAM reader and give it the file name. Uh, this could be multiple files. You can use indices and all the good things you're used to if you use a GATK. Um, and this particular example is just calculating the average base quality of a read and outputting it to, uh, to, to, to the I.O. stream. This is just a contrived example just to show um, its utility. Um, <clears throat> we have added some facilities to make it easier to do functional programming with the library as well. So here's a good example. We added this uh, template function called selective, which enables you to do things like select all the genotypes that are heterozygous, for example. Any uh, lambda that you want to apply there, for anything that it returns true, the result of selective will be a bit set with those bits set to, to one. So all the samples that agree with whatever lambda that you give will be set to true. What this enables you to do is things like this. So you can select all the high quality variants on a record by running two selective uh, queries and then doing an end on them. So the first query here, selective, is the passing quality. So you want all the, all the genotypes that have quality or likelihoods higher than a certain threshold. So you just call selective with the, with the qualities, um, with the quality fields and return true for everything that passes the, the quality threshold Q. And the second selective statement, you're going to ask if it is a variant. If it is a variant, that means that it's not missing and it's not homozygous reference. Homozygous reference meaning it has the same allele as the reference. So if that's true, you're going to get a bit set with that. Now the resulting uh, high quality variance is just the end of the two bit sets. And for that, we're using boost dynamic bit sets. And that has been working very well for us uh, in terms of parallelize parallelizability. It's very easy to make these selective statements par parallel because the variance uh, records can be very, very long. We can be dealing with hundreds, of, with hundreds of thousands of samples, and each one of these selective statements can be long. In cases like this one, though, when you're only doing two, it's actually better to just have one for loop than doing two selectives because you are going through the data twice. You do just one for looking at the two um, values at each time you'll navigate. That is actually faster. But if you're doing this a lot over and over and you want to do different combinations of the bit sets, uh, this functional construct is actually very, very useful. Uh, another thing we've been experimenting with and being quite happy with is just providing functionality that is lambda configurable, sort of like the STL uh, in some of their algorithms. So here's a very simple uh, class that allows you to do whatever you want to do with a coverage by locus. By locus, if, this is, uh, if you're not familiar with it, by locus just means at a uh, vertical view of the data. So at each position here, you want to see all the reads or do something to all the reads that overlap that position. A very typical thing you do is I want to count how many reads overlap that position. That's what we call locus coverage, for example. Or you could do um, a locus uh, a, a coverage distribution histogram. You could plot that too. So this class allows you to do whatever you want with it because it offers two callbacks for you. One, the window operation, which is a lambda that gives you the locus coverage vector. So you can do whatever you want with it or you consult it. It gives you the chromosome start and stop of the read that you were analyzing by that when you, when you overlap that window. And the, the second callback is what to do with each locus as, they, as we see that they overlap with, uh, with the read. So you could overload this to do anything you want. The default behavior is just add one to the coverage. And in the end, you have the vector with how many reads overlap that region. But you could overload that with anything you want. So here's an example to calculate the coverage distribution. And I'm not going to spend too much time here. You can just define the window operation 
to <coughs> uh, increment the histogram every time it passes through the locus coverage. Remember, the locus coverage is the vector that contains the number of uh, reads that overlapped each position in the genome. And every time you navigate through it, you just go there and say, mm, this position has seen 25 reads. This position has seen 35 reads. And in the end, you have a histogram of all the coverage, which is a very useful tool that we do for quality control. So just to wrap up, uh, the future of the JTK, and this is uh, something we get asked a lot, and we're sort of prepared now to, to answer, is that both JTK C++ and JTK Java will be available. We'll continue to maintain Java version. We're not discontinuing the Java version. Um, New tools may probably be written in C++. Probably they will be all written in C++. Old tools will slowly be rewritten to C++ in the C++ framework. Uh, but uh, uh, both of them will be released in the same scheme. Gamgee, which is the library that allows us to write programs, is 100% free, open source, MIT licensed. It's already on GitHub, so please go there and use it today. Uh, it's under heavy development, of course. but. Uh, it's this close to being feature complete, and as we are able to write code, you should be able to. Um, soon we will also release a tool developer framework, very similar to what we did initially with the Java framework, but in the C++ framework, built on top of Gamgee. Uh, once that is out, that's not built yet. We're working on a very bare bones version of it right now. Once we build that, that is also going to be available, MIT license, open source. Uh, and the tools themselves, well, those continue to be G8K licensed until further notice. And both C++ and Java, the tools that we build, will continue to be released like so. Just uh, to tell you what our intentions are, especially with um, the C++ framework, we have been aiming to tackle the third pane of that uh, best practices pi pipeline. So the left side of it involves sequencing a lot of things, going through the best practices pipeline, and producing uh, variants. That part, yes, it's slow. I showed why it's slow. It was the whole motivation to change. But you know, we, we can kind of push it, push more compute, more compute, and just get it done. But the other side of that pain, which I didn't even talk about, there's nothing we can do. That other side today is failing in projects with as little as 13,000 exomes. Because that side has not even seen any kind of rigorous uh, systematic approach, systematic computational approach, as we have to the left side. That side has been left to um, tools, R scripts, Perl scripts, Python scripts written by postdocs that left, died, moved, never maintained, never published, or published but didn't publish the source code. But that is what the research is dependent on. So that what runs, that is what runs on the variants that we produced on the left side of the paint. That right side is not standardized, it's not optimized, it's not up to, to speed, and we already cannot do the analysis on the large projects that we already have today, let alone tomorrow. Uh, so our main focus right now is to write tools and standardize that side so we can leverage all of the power and the potential of the GAMG and the C++ framework. And we highly welcome your participation and your collaboration. We're very happy to take pull requests. We're very happy to take collaborators. There are already people, more than five people, outside of the bro that are, have contributed to, to the GAMG project. And we do uh, encourage your participation as well. So this is not just me, it's the work of many people. I just want to highlight uh, David Rosen, who's here, who contributed a lot of slides and work for Gamgee, and uh, Hung Lee, who wrote BWA and a lot of the things you're talking about here, including the first iteration of the C library of the parsing of these formats that we use uh, inside Gamgee called ATSLib. Uh, he sits next to us, and he's a huge resource. Uh, so thank you very much, and I, I'm happy to take any questions. It is the same group, uh, I mean, people change, uh, some people left. For the most part, it is the same group of people. So what you had is a group that started out in Java and then transitioned to C++. Yes. And so I have a couple questions about that. Absolutely. Did, was it, did they find it difficult? And uh, did they drag their feet on it or, or find um. themselves uncooperative? <laughs> well, I mean, like, we got, we got a little bit of everything. We got people who jumped in right away, loved it, best thing ever happened to them. Other people who were still 
until this day, like, ah, I don't want to shift. I'm comfortable here. This thing works. I don't want to. Uh, we have a little bit of everything. Um, we have two advantages, though. First one is the group is not big. We are 13 people, um, although we do want this to grow outside of our group and throughout the road and also across, uh, across the world. So we'll face bigger difficulties. And maybe next year, I'll, I'll have a different story to tell. But in our group, because it's small, setting the directions is not that hard to do, even though some people uh, were reluctant. Uh, the second advantage is we're starting from scratch. We were able to sit down, starting with GCC 4.9 and Clang 3.5, and you know, use all of the new features that really make it a lot easier for people to get, come into C++, even if they never worked on it before. I, I am finding, uh, find, finding a lot of resistance on developers that are not in our group. People we can't just say, we are moving. Uh, I found a lot of resistance. Uh, people are not ready to make that move, I would say, most people. Um, but uh, I can quote, the, the, we probably all see this, uh, the Dr. Bo Dobbs uh, language usage uh, report every year. And you can see there that Java, if it wasn't for Android, Java would be in a steep decline of usage. Uh, for the last few years, and uh, that is being reflected. It is, it's been stuck, as you said. It, it, there's very little going on over there, and I think slowly people will start to notice. And the fact that we have these you know, big conferences of C++ growing in importance and, and flying closer and closer to their radar may help uh, people change their minds. But Today, everyone who is. Right. Better IDE would be huge. <laughs> a better IDE. Uh, we do get a lot of complaints because JetBrains, IntelliJ is great, and people don't like Eclipse and everything like that. Uh, we do not have Windows at the Broad Institute, so uh, I, I can't answer that one. Yeah, uh, most people are using Eclipse, and uh, it, it, it's, it's, not quite, quite it's not quite, not even close to what IntelliJ is. But that, that's probably a minor point. Uh, people will switch anyway. Uh, I was going to say, most people are reluctant to change, not because of what's missing, but because of their preconceptions of C++, that it is this giant monster that's going to eat them if they turn around. It, it is. It is what I hear from, from everyone. So everyone says the same thing. It's like, I don't want to be dealing with deletes and exception safety and uh, handling memory, I, I'm done with all that. That's so 90s, 1990s, and uh, they don't even listen to you. I think that is the real obstacle. So you would summarize and say that the biggest problem is the perception or misperception depending on your point of view that it's more complicated than it needs to be. Yes, that is the most kind of and complaints that I get. Very helpful. Uh, that's yes, that's what I hear the most. Uh, I, I can enumerate several small things like IDE is not so nice. The, the build systems are kind of not standardized. It's hard to find a good one. Distribution of libraries is difficult to do. Um, th th there's a lot of small points that once they make the switch, they start complaining about. Uh, but the number one is, I don't want to deal with this. This is, I'm going to, you're crazy. Yeah. Oh, God. I, I heard so many times that there's no way you're going to do a large code base in C++. I think most large code bases in the world are written in C and C++. I don't know yeah, what you're talking about. Well, most of the big companies are that way. Yes. I'm, I'm curious what, what motivation behind, I mean, I understand the reluctance of trying to fully justify. Yes. I'm kind of curious. Uh, you guys kind of overcame it. Right.
Oh, that is a, there's a great point. Um, hopefully not. Uh, we, do, we don't have a release blend yet, but uh, we do have a plan to, when we do release, to still make it easy for the Lambda users. We do have most of our users are Lambda users. They're not programmers. We're not going to dump source code into their hands to build. That's definitely what, not what we're going to do. Uh, there are options out there. You know, Microsoft Office is you know, mostly C++, and it, you don't have to compile their code to, to install. So there are ways to, to distribute code that's not going to be the most optimal for your machine, but the Lambda users will still be able to access as they do today, if not better. Uh, so, so we do have a plan for them. We're not changing that. That's, that's part of our plan. We don't want to uh, freak people out by saying, oh, no, here's the source code. Yes? Right, absolutely. Right, so uh, when I started writing this uh, about a year ago, the, my first thing was I saw CCAN, I started working on their code base and tried a few things. And uh, it's a great resource, but they have a lot of constraints. And the most important one, they do not allow C11 code in it. Um, so there, that was a huge constraint to me. And when I started reading their code, um, a lot of the things were just red flags, like the, the whole. Uh, all, all the read bases are treated as special classes that are separate. There's not much of a performance inclination on their code, as far as I could see. I could be totally wrong because I did not profile or, or did any performance analysis against them. Uh, but their focus there is really aimed towards uh, assembly, assembly code. They have a lot of algorithms for assembly and nothing that we could actually reuse. So very quickly, my decision was to drop it and we didn't use it. I actually met them at the NVIDIA GPU technology conference. Uh, great people. I think it's a good group. Uh, nothing against them. Uh, we just, I, I didn't do the comparison. I think at some point we should definitely do uh, to learn and see what we can improve. But, yeah. Great. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. It is. It is all there. It's all available. It's on GitHub, github.com slash Broad Institute slash uh, this, this, this is all there. Most of the functionality is in. We're this close to being feature complete. We'll make a full release at that point. Uh, but again, we accept pull requests. Our issues are open. You can see what we're working on. And it is usable. It is meant to be a library. It's how we are going to use it. Once we, work on the, uh, once we start developing the framework, the tool development framework, it'll be built on top of Gamgee, and that's how it's supposed to be, and it'll stay like that. So yes, please, please do start using it today, and uh, yeah, and join, join us. Okay, thank you very much.